So if you'd like to learn about the church, that's the way to do it. Um, another thing to go over, uh, just our 40 hours of prayer concluded this morning. Um, many of you I know came through and were part of that. And I just want to say thank you for people who were involved in putting that together. And just for everyone who came to pray for the church, pray and thank God and prepare our hearts for Easter. And here we are standing here remembering the Lord's death for Easter. Brandon's going to come up now and read the first section of Ezekiel 37. And as he reads this, I want you to pay special attention to how it describes those who are unfaithful and without hope. So Brandon's going to read for us, starting in verse 1. pray with me. Lord, as we celebrate Easter, as we celebrate the resurrection, as we look and talk about what that is for you, the church, and what that is worth celebrating here thousands of years later, Lord, I pray that you would give life to dry bones again, that in my heart and the people here, that you would work within us with your spirit and give life to our mortal bodies through the same spirit who rose Christ from the dead. Lord, you have promised that you will, and we believe it to be true. It's in Christ's name we pray. Bunnies are everywhere right now. I'm not talking about in the field, but I'm talking about if you go walk through the mall, you'll see a bunny dressed up. This was us a week and a half ago or so. Um, I were walking through the mall, and uh, I had to share this. Just She was happy, and she was excited about the bunny until Mom walked away, and then that's her crying to get Mom. Um, but bunnies are bunnies are everywhere, uh, not just here. Even if you go to the Bass Pro Shop, I think you can do it for a little bit cheaper. So if you want to go to Bass Pro and get a, a shot of that, same thing with eggs. They're everywhere, and it's it's not a new phenomenon around Easter. Believe it or not, this, as far as I can tell, this traces back to the middle of the Middle Ages, when on 
manuscripts, they would make these special paintings kind of depicting kind of in a special way what was going on in these scenes. And, and they had these bunnies who were, were very, very violent in these manuscripts. All of the manuscripts I've seen of this, the bunny is killing somebody or hauling someone away to slavery. And it's kind of a gruesome symbol. But the real point behind this and why they're depicting it in this way is the bunny is supposed to represent if this person was defeated and they were defeated by a bunny, it was shameful. So if, if you're defeated by some sort of bunny, it's shameful. And eventually the Lutherans brought that over to America in the 1700s, and that's why you see Easter bunnies around this time here today. But I bring this up for a very special reason, not just because it's kind of a cool piece of history, because we're here to celebrate something. A shameful defeat of death. This symbol that we've talked about when we're going through communion, this symbol that was originally a sign of shame of defeat of, of Christ or any of the other thousands of people who were crucified around the first century. But instead of it being a shame for Christ, we read in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, He made a public spectacle of His enemies conquering death and defeating death. See, today is really about the celebration of this defeat of death, this shameful defeat of death. Just like we saw earlier in Ezekiel, just because someone is dead, it doesn't mean that God is done working in their life. In fact, you could say that it wasn't until Christ gave them their spirit that they had life to begin with. I want to share with you a passage, a few passages from Scripture that sort of speak to this idea of being dead before you have Christ, being dead in your sins. This is Ephesians 2, verse 1. When you used to walk in the ways of this world, you were dead in your sins. Matthew 23, verse 27. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, whitewashed graves, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and every kind of impurity. You can begin to see immediately how this calls back to Ezekiel 37. That when the Scriptures describe someone who's living unfaithfully to God, one of the most common ways it describes is the most common imagery that I have ever seen in Scripture, from the prophets to the Gospels, is to describe someone as dead on the inside. So if today we're talking about the defeat of death, yes, we need to talk about when we stop breathing, and we'll get to that. But even more, and even more crucial to Ezekiel, even more crucial to the Gospels, is this idea of us, while we're here on earth, stepping over from death to life because of the resurrection. I want to share what looks like two verses. It's the same verse. This is from Luke 17, verse 33. And, and the, the first one is, is usually how you'll, you'll find this verse. It's, most English translations have it this way. Whoever tries to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. That's how most English translations will have it. It's going through Luke with a friend of mine from school. And we noticed something very interesting, and, and we looked into it, and the churches always seem to teach this about this passage, that those two words for life in this passage are two entirely different words. Completely different Greek words. And this is how the verse actually should be read, and this is how the church has always understood this passage. So a, a more correct version of this, Luke 17, verse 33, whoever tries to save their breath will lose it. But whoever loses it for my sake will find life. See how the importance of it. It's not that you actually have life and you try to hold on to it, but it's that you try to hold on to something that is by nature temporary. And unless you willingly give it up for Christ, you won't have life. Breath is by design. We're animated, we're existing, we're walking, we're breathing, we're moving. But until Christ comes into our life and until we lose it for the sake of Christ, we will not have life. It's the same reason that one of the lines in the song that we sang this morning and the song that we sing frequently is that we're breathing but not alive. That's actually coming back out of this passage exactly. See, in Christianity, life is not just about breathing. 
we're not interested in just existing and surviving, but part of what is really at the crux of the Gospel and part of the good news that we have to share today is that the life that Jesus offers is more abundant than any other offered in this world. Our passage in Ezekiel speaks to this in several ways that I really want us to see this morning. The problem with Israel wasn't that they weren't breathing. In fact, they were living long lives. They were yeah, in exile at times, and they were enslaved, but they were prospering. They were you know, living their life. That's the people that God calls dry bones. That's the people that God calls dead in Ezekiel 37. Not to get ahead of myself too much, but part of the Gospel that we are celebrating today is that life with Jesus is better for us. And sometimes it's easy to see. Sometimes it is really easy to see why Scripture, why God would call life without Him dead. Why life in sin, why an unfaithful life is called dry bones. And sometimes it's easy to see why He would call it that because the reality of the pain of sin is sometimes very obvious. Eight years ago, when I was in college and when I was starting to preach at a church, and I learned about what had happened about the previous minister who had abused his grandkids in the congregation that was completely broken by it, I was reminded very clearly why God would call sin dead bones. Every time I turn on the news, every time I hear about another pastor being unfaithful to his wife, I'm reminded of why God would call sin dry bones. Every time I hear about another child abused, every time I hear about slavery or people who are impoverished staying that way year after year, it's not that hard to see why God would call sin dry bones. Just about every week, while I'm at my house, while I'm being mean, and while I say things that I shouldn't say to my wife, and I'm hit with remorse by it, Immediately, I am reminded quite clearly why God would call sin dry bones. Dead. Because it's actually more miserable to live with sin than to allow God to free us from it. See, many of you may be very aware of the fact there are parts of you that are dry bones. There are parts of you that God needs to resurrect. And for that, you ought to be thankful. You would rather know about some disease that's harming you instead of it silently killing you little by little. But some of you may not be thinking that. You know, when we open up the Scriptures and we go through the list and say, well, I haven't done that. I haven't done that evil. So I, I'm not really missing out because I don't see what God could offer me that's really better than what I have now had those conversations with people, but usually those are the ones who stay silent whenever I talk about it, or the ones who agree, but I could tell they're actually disagreeing with what I'm saying. Is it really better? Because I'm not missing out by much, and I'm not following Jesus now. So what good is it if I decided to accept Him or not? Let me share with you a passage from Revelation chapter 3, because this is worth discussing. And it's an honest opinion. I'm not saying that anyone who has that thought is lying. In fact, I sympathize with you. If I could say it just plainly and as brutal as I can, is it just possible that you don't know how much sin is harming your own life? I'll share with you Revelation chapter 3, verse 17. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Sometimes, as the Psalms say, we can't discern our own sins. And sometimes God will let you go through things so you actually have to ask yourself difficult questions to come to terms with this, that Christ is the only one who offers the abundant life. You know, respectfully, if you think that you don't need Christ to have this more abundant life, May I just suggest that just as you sometimes think that people are ignorant of their own harm, you might be ignorant of your own. Mallory's got this giant textbook. Giant textbook. 1,800 pages. 
And I, I know that because I carry it off our desk just about every day because we're both kind of going back and forth between working. And in and, and the whole textbook, if you go through it, it's just 1,800 pages of various diseases. And at the beginning of each entry is a list of possible symptoms that you can have by it, so you can diagnose it. And the symptoms, it's kind of interesting. She'll talk about this with me. The symptoms sometimes have nothing to do, at least by appearances, with what's going on, with what's actually wrong. Your arm hurts. Well, that's obviously a problem with the lower part of your spine. Or you have a headache. Well, that's a problem with your liver in this particular case. 1,800 pages of that. And it occurred to me that this is exactly how sin manifests in us. You don't deal with a certain sin in your life and it manifests in pornography. You don't deal with having Christ as your Lord and it results in you being angry day after day and being bitter and living with your own wrath. See, sometimes the roots of sin so so deep that it manifests in ways that you're not able to understand until Christ goes in and heals you of what the real problem is. Ask anyone who lives with a chronic illness and they'll tell you there are lots of problems that come with it that you wouldn't expect. It's the same exact thing with sin. Problems occur and manifest in ways that people don't always expect. And see, on one hand, if you're here today and, and maybe you haven't stepped in church since the last time a relative asked you to come, that's okay. Um, we want you to feel welcome today. The resurrection is offered for everybody. Um, but on the other hand, I want to make ourselves very clear this morning. We do expect for people who are coming to know Christ to change their lives for the better. You know, if I were to go to church for every Sunday of my life and at the end of 50, 60 years of my life, I wasn't any different, I wouldn't want to be a part of that faith. And so there's a part of me by saying, yes, we're, we're like you, we're sinners, but there's another part of me that wants to say this, we have experienced the new life. And there's something worth changing. There's something worth going in a little bit deeper because Christ actually offers a better way of living. We want to help you stop your addiction to pornography, not because it's some arbitrary rule that God has put in place, but because it's actually better to live without it. Because what God wants for us is actually the best thing for us. Lots of Christians through the years, Augustine may be the first among them, they've all highlighted this point. And when they talk about it, they talk about it in terms like this. They say, our hearts are restless until they find you. See, what you're reaching for whenever you sin, what you're reaching out and hoping that will satisfy, will only actually be truly satisfied with the one who created that desire in the first place. Joy in Christ. See, what if the one who made us knows what we were made for and wants to give it to us? Part of celebrating Jesus and the defeat of death, and not just the defeat of death, but the defeat of death by dying, is that we can celebrate this new life. So here's what I want to do with the rest of our time. I want to just talk about in very practical terms why that matters and kind of get to our, our main point for us this morning. And so for one, it shows us that the death is not the end for those who give their lives to follow Him. We talk about this frequently in church, and I, I hope we do uh, even more so. At least I hope that is one of my goals for this coming years, is to talk about death more. See, as the rest of the world prepares for retirement, the Christian, and what the church is called to do is to prepare for death. That certain thing that is coming, whether it be a year from now, whether it be today, or whether it be several years from now, there is only one end for all of us. You and I are going to have to stand with the man who died on the cross, and we are going to have to give an account to say if we followed him or not. There is no escaping that. Like it or not, you will stand before Jesus. Those who followed him will be put on his right, and those who did not will be put on his left. And there's no escaping that. But there is this good side of it. He has promised us the same one who's going to judge us is also our defender. The one who is going to put us on the right 
has promised us that if we follow Him, that if we put our trust in Him, that if we're baptized into His death, we will also have this eternal life. So many Christians, and I know many of you are afraid to admit this. I'm oftentimes afraid to admit this. Sometimes it's, it's, it's not quite clear for certain we're going to go to heaven or not. You know, we know that God had died for, for people, but we're not quite sure if it's for us yet or not. Well, let me just say this plainly. If Jesus is your Lord and you have trusted Him, and you have given your life to Him, He has promised you, you will be on His right. And just to ask you plainly, don't you think that the blood of Christ is enough? Don't belittle what Jesus did. And if you're like me and still doubt it sometimes, even after hearing that, be comforted by the words from 1 John chapter 3. He is greater than our hearts and will cleanse us from unrighteousness. You don't have to feel forgiven to be forgiven. You don't have to feel like you're worshiping to have a connection with God. In fact, sometimes I wonder and I worry that we judge the usefulness of our worship the same way that someone who is addicted to drugs judges their meth. The way it makes them feel in the moment. No, true worship in spirit and in truth sometimes leaves you feeling empty. That does not mean that Christ is far from you. See, what happens to someone when they turn to the Lord and is baptized is truly beautiful. It's equivalent to dry bones coming to life. And with that in mind, I want to share for you what really is the only point that I have this morning, the main thing that I have, and the part of the celebration of Easter that I think after many hours in prayer, that this is what God wants me to share with us this morning. The resurrection of Jesus is our own resurrection. See, it's not just that Christ resurrected and so He has the option of resurrecting you too. Okay, that, that's, that's true. He resurrects people. He resurrected Lazarus. He resurrected people when He died. But more specifically with the way that Scripture describes this, if you go and talk in, in the book of Galatians and Colossians and Corinthians and look through how it describes our own resurrection, you'll find that every time without exception, it connects us with Christ's resurrection. So much so that at least 164 times that I have seen, it, just in Paul, it talks about the church as those who are in Christ and in the Lord. See, the resurrection of Jesus is my resurrection because I have been united with Him in His death and I will be united with Him in His resurrection. I'm going to read for you a few passages that describe this and pay very close attention. It's not just that He did it there and so He can do it also here. It's that we're invited when we are baptized, when we turn our lives to Christ, to be buried with Him and to be resurrected as a new creation. It's Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, gave Himself for me. Romans 6, verse 4, We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised through the dead to the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been united with Him in a death like this, we will certainly also be united with Him in a resurrection like His. And skip the rest, but I want you to go back and read that whole chapter just because of the, the whole message today is summed up in Romans 6. What's happening in these passages is quite clear. We are invited to suffer with Christ as we go down in baptism and as we are raised up. It's not just that Christ is doing a resurrection, but it's His resurrection happening with us. Why is it that once we are baptized, as 1 Corinthians 12.13 says, we become a part of the body of Christ. Because the church, as we gather together and as we go out from here, we are that body. We are the power of the resurrection of Jesus. And every part of my life that reflects the life of Jesus, the more and more I do that, the better and better ambassador I am for the sake of Christ, 
That is just showing more and more the power of the resurrection. Why does Romans 8, for example, make such a big deal out of this? That it's the same Spirit who rose Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal body, says Paul in Romans 8. Because the same Spirit who rose Christ from the dead in this room as you're listening to me, as you drive away in your car and aren't even thinking about this, He is at work in your life giving you the power of the resurrection so that you can reflect Christ better. As we are speaking now, He is giving life to dry bones. Resurrecting people from a life of death who try to hold on to their breath, but as they finally give it away, He resurrects them through His Spirit. See, each and every day, my life experiences the power of the resurrection, and so does yours. Christ is at work in your life. So if I could add something briefly to what I said earlier. The resurrection of Jesus is our resurrection. And as surely as He rose, we can rise with Him and walk in a new life. Whether you deal with this question now or you deal with it when you die, you're going to be faced with this question. Do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? It's better if you deal with this now because it affects what happens after you die. But you're going to have to be faced with this question. You're going to be faced with the reality of Jesus sooner or later. It's better to not simply put it off. And I, I want to spend just a moment this morning discussing with you why I personally believe that Christ really did rise from the dead 2,000 years ago. You know, at this point in my, my life, I've devoted my entire academic career to history, to going through those boring medieval manuscripts with bunnies on it and trying to find those points so that I could bring it together and make some sort of coherent paper out of it. That's what I do with a lot of my time. And I just want to say it this way up, up front, and I'll, I'll go through why I believe this. Of all the events that we have documented in the first century, I do not know of a single event that has more witnesses write about it than the resurrection of Jesus. Of anything that happened in the first century, you know, compare that to someone that we all know existed and lived and died, Alexander the Great who, by the way, the only manuscripts that we have of him, the earliest ones, are a hundred years after he died. We have portions of the Gospel of John, an eyewitness of Jesus, mind you, a decade after John wrote it, traveling thousands of miles. 35,000 of these manuscripts existing in these early centuries of the church, all pointing to the fact that these people actually saw it. And not just with the manuscripts, but the men themselves. You have 12 men, well, 11 men, who fled when they saw that Jesus was going to die. Something happened. Something had to have happened because the Roman Empire that they were fleeing from, they didn't want to die anymore from, suddenly they were all willing to go out and to be killed ruthlessly by them. Can you imagine the apostles sitting around wanting to make up this story and saying, hey guys, I know we're probably going to die for this. I know we're not going to get wealthy. I know we're going to live shorter lives. And I know we're going to be tortured and persecuted. But I think it would be really cool if we went out and started talking as if Jesus had resurrected. See, Eleven people don't come together and do that. And what's more than that, as Paul is writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 15, just a few decades after Jesus was crucified and resurrected, he makes the claim to the Corinth, the people living in Corinth, 500 people saw Him at one time. You can go and speak to them. Paul's entire argument would be crumbled to dust if they couldn't go and speak to Him. But apparently there were enough people throughout the Roman Empire who saw Jesus resurrected that He could write that a thousand miles away and people knew immediately what He was talking about. But honestly, my favorite and my clearest proof of, of Jesus and His resurrection in Acts chapter 2. Just inside the city, Jesus was crucified outside of Jerusalem and inside of Jerusalem to the same crowd who crucified Him. 
Peter is able to say just 50 days later, Jesus rose from the dead. And all of them, all they would have to do is point to the tomb and say, no, his body's right here. But what did they do instead? 3,000 of them in a single day were baptized. See, when you look at the facts of the resurrection, you have to come with this in your mind. Our doubts, my own doubts of the resurrection, are not based on the facts, but of something severely wrong with my soul. See, the resurrection is true. At a certain point, another proof of the resurrection is what I have seen the resurrection do in my own life. As these dry bones, this heartless soul that I've had for so long has been put on more and more flesh as I become more and more like the body of Christ and reflect Him. Yeah, I want my life to be a testimony to the fact that Christ did raise from the dead. And I believe through the years, God has proved that to me by how He has changed me. See, the resurrection of Jesus is our own resurrection. And as surely as He rose, we can rise with Him and walk in a new life. You can rise with Him today. You know, many of you have heard me speak about my brother. Um, my brother Jeff is spending life in prison uh, for murder. For many years of his life, completely, utterly rejected Christ and the Gospel. Led him to do some pretty unspeakable things. Eventually going on to prison and then ten days after he gets out of prison, going back for life. And as we've worked with him over the last seven years that he's been there, I've seen this process take place, this real power of the resurrection. This person who, as I would describe him as dry bones, completely uninterested in Jesus, but as our family spoke with him, as our family communicated grace with him and prayed with him, slowly these dry bones, through the Spirit of God, put on flesh and life. Now, if you go to the Southeast Correctional Facility in Missouri, and you go to my brother's cell, you'll find that he is the only one in his little area that leads two separate Bible studies. You'll find, if you look through his emails, how he emails my family every week and tells us that he loves us and that he loves Christ, and that he's excited to meet us at Judah Gate. See, if you go to Southeast Correctional Facility now, you won't see the bones of a dry man. No, you'll see the power of a resurrection. When a life is really changed through God's Spirit. Even though my brother's in prison, he's never been more free. Never been so free from the slavery that he was already in with sin. Some of you today may be more in prison than he is. and may not even realize it. The trap of sin, the harm of sin and its subtleties the snares that Satan lays out for people really do cause harm to the extent that we could describe that as causing death in our lives, causing us to be whitewashed graves, whitewashed tombs inwardly. Part of what we're celebrating today and what I'm so thankful for that this is the reality and that I don't have to mourn things without hope is that just as Christ rose from the dead, our lives can rise with Him through His Spirit. So this morning, if that is a choice that you want to do, if you want to rise with Christ, if you want to start this new life, I'm going to ask you to come forward as we sing this song. But I, I also want to make this offer to you as well. If you want to just come forward and have someone pray with you so that you can put on Christ more, so that you can rise from the bones more through God's help, this is a time to come forward and ask, for that prayer. There will be people all around us as we sing this song. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank You for what the resurrection means. That shameful defeat of death. For taking the enemy's weapon on Golgotha and, and defeating it. Thank You, Lord, for giving life to our bodies. For offering us that same power. For changing us. And Lord, we pray that we would not hold on to our breath, but by Your design, we would give it up freely so that we can really enjoy life and the Spirit that gives it.
Lord, if there is someone here this morning who needs to make that choice to follow You, I pray that You would take down the whatever it is in their heart that's causing them. And that through Your power, You would drag them and pull them to Yourself. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Surely on that day He took our pain For our suffering and all our shame For our sin a man was slain Yet like sheep we've gone astray Like a lamb unto its shepherd's feet Nothing wakened from the Savior's speech. Into darkness plunged our victory. No guilt to bear, no death will free. Savior King, you're all I need. For your name I'll gladly bleed. At your cross I'll bow my knee and worship. Um, Elaine has an important appointment tomorrow. Um, you know, she she battled cancer 13 years ago, and um, she's looks like she's uh, 
battling something very similar again. So tomorrow is going to be determining a lot. Same song, second verse. And um, we're just going to be praying for We do believe, as the Scripture says in James, that if you know if the prayer offered in faith will heal you. And we believe that the elders should gather around and pray for that very reason. And so I'll start us off. If Kyle, you want to pray as well? And uh, Bonnie, you want to close this off? Lord, you have told us that we ought to gather around and pray and the prayer offered in faith to heal her. So we pray in the name of Jesus that you would heal her for complete healing. But if not, Lord, we pray that she and Jem would be found faithful. In Christ's name. Uh, just a, one more quick reminder. Uh, so the new members class, which you don't have to be a new member for, if you just want to find out more information about the church, that the sign up for that's in the lobby. Um, and we're going to say Happy Easter. So I'm going to pray for us one more time, and then we'll be dismissed from here today. Lord, we thank you for defeating death and offering us uh, through taking on our sufferings that we can take on yours and rise with you. And I pray, Lord, as we leave here, that the power of the resurrection will be evident in our lives, that as people see us, they see a risen Lord in the body of Christ. Help us to not live as a corpse, as a useless faith, but to produce fruit by living with you through your spirit. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Also, one more thing, if there are children here that did not get to participate in the Easter egg hunt, then we have a small gift for you, and you can see Miss Shari after. Thank you.